Roma. Uh, our last reader, but not least, has a taste in literature that spans from Toni Morrison to Stephen King to Cormac McCarthy. He always looks for a different angle to approach time-tested subject matter that traffics in the macabre and the grotesque. His thesis incorporates these themes as well as biblical and southern gothic elements. When he is not writing, he enjoys spending time with his wife, cooking, reading, and taking the dog for swims in the Wissahickon Creek. He thanks you ahead of time for being here tonight. Please welcome Max Wasserman. I'm just going to read the prologue of this novel. Uh, it takes place about 1,500 years before the rest of the novel. A shepherd found him on the other side of the ridge that protected their village from the desert and the wolves that roamed within it. Amid a herd of braying goats, he sat naked and slender under a boiling sun. His skin was pale like milk. Shepherd, he said, rising from the sand. His figure was near skeletal, and he felt as such. The climb out of the sour earth had left him weak and famished. The hunger had began to build in his belly, but he smiled at the goat herder. And who might you be? the shepherd asked. I am a traveler, the pale man replied. One with ill fortune. For on the eastern road I met three thieves, and they stripped me clean. <laughs> the pale man ran his hands over his body. That is how I came to appear as such. The eastern road, was it, the shepherd asked. He had a black beard that he picked at with one hand, and in the other hand he held a staff tight. The pale man nodded, and save for the relentless braying of the goats, neither spoke. The shepherd studied the man, his fingers twisting tufts of oil black hair in his beard. The pale man felt no need to plead or beg. He could hear the goat herder thinking, the sound of the man's mind and heart warring against one another. The shepherd's father had distrusted strangers, but the shepherd's mother had taught him to help those in need, the mind of his father and the heart of his mother. The goat herder let go of his beard. You may come into the village and stay with my family and I, the shepherd said. The pale man smiled. It had been 500 years since he last walked the face of the earth, and it was a comfort to know that the heart and the mother still held sway over mankind. I thank you, dear shepherd, the pale man said. On the walk over the ridge, the shepherd told the pale man of the famine and the drought that had fallen over the land. In the village, a plague killed young and old alike as well. The eldest in the village believe that the world has turned sour, the shepherd said. Perhaps, but when is it not felt that way for desert folk, the pale man said. The shepherd nodded and then cleared his throat. The plague, it took my son three days prior, the shepherd said, his voice breaking under the weight of his own grief. The pale man, now outfitted in the shepherd's outer robe, slid his arm around the goat herder. I am sorry, dear shepherd, for the death of your boy. I too am sorry for my speaking of my own ill fortune earlier. It must have been offensive to you, knowing what I do now, the pale man said. They crested the ridge, and the pale man saw the village. Rows of huts made from mud and wood stretched from the bottom of the ridge to the foothills of the mountains that rose up in the east. Villagers trod on cracked and dusty thoroughfares. All about the village and its people, there was an air that the pale man recognized. He sucked it in through his thin nostrils and swallowed, tasting despair. It settled his belly. I take no offense, the shepherd said. You and your people have suffered far beyond anything that I have experienced, the pale man replied. They began their descent, swimming through the sea of thin goats that accompanied the shepherd. Before they reached the bottom of the ridge, the, the goat herder clutched the pale man's shoulder and stopped him. I can't speak this way around my wife and daughter. I can't speak this way at all down there, so please do pardon me for asking this. Do not think poorly of me, but I must ask this question of, my, of someone besides myself. It weighs heavy in my heart since my son was taken from me. You may ask me anything you want, dear shepherd, the pale man replied, and put his hands on the goat herder's shoulder like a holy man preparing to receive some confession. Do you believe in God? the shepherd asked. Yes, the pale man said. He could hear children playing in the thoroughfares, and it brought some hint of color to his cheeks. This was a fertile land for him. Why? the shepherd asked. Because I have seen him. I felt his touch, his love, and then the pale man paused, and his displeasure. The shepherd held out his arms and seemed to encompass the entire village within them. But this, the shepherd replied, this is none of those, this is indifference. The shepherd dropped his hands, forgive me, I'm a poor host. You're a grieving man in a suffering village, there is no need for apology, the pale man interrupted. The shepherd nodded and they walked with arms interlocked into the village. It is hard not to despair in such circumstance, though, the pale man said. That I do understand. No one hears us, the shepherd said. The pale man smiled. Someone always hears. This I know. The shepherd looked at him and smiled a weary smile. I want to believe that. You will, the pale man said. And then there were stories, tales that traveled on the wind of a strange pale man that had walked into the dying village where the desert met the mountains and resurrected it into a land that flowed with milk and honey. 
There were stories about merchants, tradesmen, and holy men who sought out the village, in an audience with the one they took to calling the Pale King. There were stories of great festivals and celebration and honors of, in honor of the villagers and their Pale King. But then there were strange stories of offerings and sacrifices that were not only against the laws of man but the laws of nature, tales of an orchard that grew from the dead, and tales about the Pale King himself that many could not bring themselves to repeat. One day, a group of fledgling Ford mer merchants traveled on the western road. They had come from the sea bearing spices and medicines from the other side of the world, seeking out the village and the Pale King. It was said that every merchant who traded with the village was made wealthy. The Pale King saw to it. But when the merchants arrived at the ridge, they saw a terrible sight. The great village of the Pale King lay rent and smoldering. The land was scorched black and the homes of the village were rubble. And at the bottom of the ridge, a crippled old man crawled toward them. It was the shepherd. Turn back, he screamed at the merchants. There is nothing but death here now. Turn back. They discarded his warning and went to him, taking him up in their arms and carrying him to a plot of the village that was not scorched. They forced water, <coughs> they forced water between his torn lips and down his throat, and eventually he sucked it down on his own. He finished and coughed up a gout of blood and then spat. Over the sea they tell stories of this place, the merchant captain said to the shepherd. They call it Eden. It was, the shepherd replied. He coughed once more and then wiped blood from his lips. What happened here, old man? The merchant captain asked. The sky, it fell on us, the shepherd replied. The merchant captain looked at him as the shepherd continued. A child on the ridge one morning. He wore white robes. Old man, I did not travel halfway around the world to be regaled with lies, the merchant captain said and then snapped his finger. A vial was handed to him. Inside it sloshed green liquid. I lie not, the shepherd said. It was a punishment. It was plain to all who could see that the old man was dying, and in the merchant captain's experience, the pronouncements of such men were not to be trusted. But the old man did not hesitate when he spoke, and his eyes did not move about like they were grasping for some lie to fashion his truth. Speak truth now, old man, and I can ease your journey, the merchant captain said, and then popped the cork from the vial. Speak truth, and I'll see to it that you go while you slumber. Now tell me. What became of this place? What became of this land of milk and honey? What became of the lush gardens? What became of the Pale King? The shepherd's lips creased into a sharp smile at the mention of the Pale King. The merchants waited for him to speak, but instead the shepherd shuddered. His death rattled. He was going, but before he did, he forced his voice from his ragged body one last time. The wrath of God was visited upon that serpent. The Pale Man the king, the serpent, was cast down into the black center of the earth, wounded and hissing. And in this black void it slumbered for centuries, always dreaming of what was, always stealing itself with the knowledge that there was a sliver of it embedded in the heart of everything that ever lived, and that as long as the world has ex existed, it too would exist. And soon the serpent's dreams turned from what was to what would be. Its time would come again. That's it. <laughs>